All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this class and uh, trust each of you are doing well. Uh, let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. So leave it open. Any one of us can please lead in prayer. Go ahead. Say, Christopher, if you'd like to read, lead in prayer, please. My pastor, let us pray. Our dear Father, we bless you. This is the day you have made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. It is by your power that we are alive, and it's by your mercy we see another new day. We thank you for everyone in this class, in every part, wherever they are. We give you praise, O oh Lord. And we pray that this class, Lord, will be worthwhile and valuable. We ask and lift up our teacher that by the Spirit of God, he will instruct us, Lord, in the lesson for today. And we pray that we'll be equipped again more and more for the work ahead that you have prepared for us. Thank you, Lord, for a wonderful and glorious and impactful class. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, C. All no right. Problem. So. So we're coming to the end of our course. Uh, we've almost completed. Uh, so let's just quickly do a review of what we did last week. Last week we talked about, uh, uh, you know, the leader as a coach and how, as a coach, we are uh, a few things that few responsibilities that we have is to build a stronger team, uh, enable people to uh, rise up to new levels, new challenges. Uh, and uh, you know, as a leader or as a coach, you begin to attract people who desire to be coached, right? Um, and coaches develop other people, and it doesn't end there, right? Um, so it's not like I develop we, as a leader or a coach, we develop somebody and it ends there. No, uh, they equip people to develop themselves as well. So we help them to grow, and then we teach them how to mature, how to develop themselves as well. So for example, you know, you uh, there's a young person in church and you know he's been regular and they you know eventually they become a uh, they volunteer, become a youth leader. And so it doesn't end there. Okay, I've made this person become a leader, but we equip them to develop themselves, which eventually will help them to uh, you know uh, mentor and coach others as well. Uh, work one-on-one. -on -one. We see the Lord Jesus did that in his ministry. He did work one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, take advantage of coachable moments. There will be times when uh, you know uh, you can speak into those situations, right? When situations happen, whether good, bad, uh, things may have gone your way, things may not have gone the right way. Use those moments to you know make it a teachable or a coachable moment for the other person. Inspire commitment, uh, uh, even as you coach people, uh, uh, you know, we want them to be committed. It shouldn't be like our coaching would, uh, instead of, you know, encouraging them and uplifting them, it shouldn't bring them down, but it should encourage them, right? Inspire them to, to develop themselves, to grow, right? To grow skills, to promote persistence, shape the environment that they are living in, meaning, uh, well, whatever that God has called them for, whether ministry, whether in the workplace, uh, that they, you know, they, they grow in, in what they are doing. Uh, and finally, very important, we talked about was don't force, control, or manipulate people. Right? Uh, uh, none of us uh, can force anybody to be someone they don't want to be. And if we see even the Lord Jesus Himself. Uh, you know, he didn't force his disciples, you have to do this, uh, or, or he didn't force people, you, you must go ahead and, uh, you know, you must do this, or he didn't control, he didn't manipulate, nothing, right? Uh, as a leader, he he expressed himself, he, he let people see his life, you know, they saw his life, and they saw what he is, and what he could do, and who he is, they begin to understand. They willingly were, you know, uh, they came under his leadership. And so never be in a place where we 
So yes, God has given us this role of leadership, and it's wonderful. But with this comes responsibilities, right? We are not called to control or manipulate people, or try and you know force them to do something or be something that they don't really want to be. Uh, because if we do that, uh, later we'll realize that hey, uh, you know that that person may not be happy, and eventually all our efforts uh, may go in vain because we we are not seeing the fruit. Uh, of for whatever we have done. So uh, never control or manipulate. Always be in a place where if people want to move on, let them move on, right? If people want to do something else, they feel they're called to, you know, for example, start something of their own or uh, you know, do something which they are passionate about, uh, encourage them and help them to move forward, right? So today we'll move on to the next portion. Uh, and again, I'm just going to be teaching, and in, in between, if you have any questions, any thoughts, feel free to stop me. Uh, you know, you can unmute, ask your question. You can also put your questions on the chat, and we will do our best to answer that. Right. So let's get into uh, the 27th section, uh, and we'll see how much we can cover. I'm guessing we should be able to cover the, the entire course by the end of this hour or the next hour. We can see whatever time takes. Uh, but we should be able to complete it in these two hours, right? So mentoring another Christian. Right? Uh, so we've been talking about coaching, mentoring. But let's look at this, right? Mentoring another Christian. God's dealing with us. Second Corinthians 6.18, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, in the Old Covenant, the coach All of a sudden, right, uh, there was this, because of that separation, this whole thing of father-son relationship was lost. Why? Because, only because of sin. There was, a, there was a wall of separation. And you go through all through the old covenant, right? Uh, you see the Levitical offerings, right? That day of atonement where the high priest goes and pours out the blood on the altar to... And I'm sure the entire nation is, you know, uh, their eyes are on this one high priest. And if he comes out alive, God has agreed to uh, forgive their sins and bless them as a nation. Uh, so there was this kind of a, there was this, God continued to love, but because of sin, there was separation. The relationship was marred or it was, you know, it was tainted. But after the cross, that relationship was restored. But I love what Jesus said on the cross, right? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, and, and we are talking about, in the Sun Selmas, we're talking about this divine exchange that happened on the cross, right? Where all through the old covenant, all through Jesus' ministry, he always said, my Father, right? our Father, I, me and my father are one. Everywhere he said that. But on the cross, because of the separation of this, because of sin, that he took up our sins, there was that separation. And he said, my God, it's no longer a father for a while. But why did this separation happen? So that you and I can, be, can call him father. Right? Uh, and so in 2 Corinthians 6.80, Paul is reminding the believers and he's saying, I will be a father to you. Uh, in the old covenant, he was God. Right? He's God to them. Here the relationship is restored. And he's saying, I will be a father to you. And you will be my sons and daughters. Right? Now, all of us, I'm sure, when you think about your parents uh, or you think about fathers and mothers, the first thing that comes to our mind is love or, or care or uh, a place of freedom, right? We don't have to hide anything from our parents. Uh, it, it's a place where we can just be ourselves. Uh, to, let's see, when God is saying, I'm going to, this is how I'm going to deal with you, I will be a father to you, 
and you will be my sons and daughters. So as a son and a daughter, what can you and I do? Right? We can go to the Father anytime, any moment, and ask of him. Right? So here, the first point, developing people is spiritual fathering and mothering. Right, so every time we use father, uh, it, it also it's not a gender specific thing. It's both male and female, right? Uh, so developing people is a spiritual fathering, meaning a spiritual place where people come under your leadership and they they are like sons and daughters. Right, uh, developing people cannot just be a program. It's it's not like okay. Well, we have mentorship program, 10 people register, now all 10 of them come, and they finish the program, okay, now I have mentored 10 people. No, programs are important, we need them, but developing people is an ongoing process. Right? If you look at it even in the natural, I can't say, we can't say, hey, oh, okay, I got married, I had a child, I've done my part. It's just the beginning, right? The child is born, then the child needs to be nurtured, looked after, corrected, uh, uh, you know, raised up in the right way, uh, you know, given good food, both physically, spiritual food, uh, and and given education. Everything must be done. So it's not the end that a baby, a, a child is born. Or child is born. There's so much that needs to be done after that. So even in the spiritual, there will be people who will come, become believers, uh, whether they are uh, through you or through somebody else. But they may be new, just babies in Christ. Right? Now, now that's not the end, right? Uh, when we talk about mentoring, when we talk about being a spiritual father or mother, it is a constant looking after. So you continue to develop that child. And eventually, you know, when in the natural, when you look at a child and they grow up, they become probably an adult, they become about 18 years old, we let go. Right? Okay, he's matured enough to make his own decisions. Uh, he's matured enough to do things that he wants to do. He's now an adult. Uh, so even in the, in the spiritual, right, even in, the, in terms of mentoring, there will be a time when we have to let go. Right? But until then, we need to be there for them. Uh, caring and love is the key. Uh, remember that each individual is unique. This is very important. Right Now, for example, there will be times when uh, people may not understand things in God's word. Right now, we may have just caught it. Right? We, may, we may have just understood some, uh, you know, deep truths in the word very easily. Right? But there are other people who, you know, maybe in the corporate sector they are wonderfully very uh, intellectual. They are high up in the uh, in their teams. They're very uh, good with their work. But maybe in in terms of the spiritual aspects, they're taking time. Right, so. Remember that each individual is unique. Maybe for us, you know, we feel that, hey, depression, suicide, nothing, just pray, and uh, that spirit of uh, infirmity or that oppression will leave in Jesus' name. Just pray. But we can be casual about it because we feel nothing will happen to us. But there are people who are going through that problem. Right? For me, it was, you know, uh, when people say, oh, I can't, you know, I always use the phone. I'm not able to uh, control using the phone. Initially, I used to think, just switch it off and throw the phone away. But we can't do that, right? Uh, I, I thought to myself, hey, everyone is unique. I mean, oh, if I had the problem, I would have done that. But I can't expect others to do the same thing. Right? So we are all unique in our own ways. Uh, so, you know, one thing that we must learn is to never look at compare people with ours ourselves and say hey I, I, if i can do it you know you also can do that it's there but then we we don't compare by saying hey you, you can do it because i did it no. and, uh, remember that every individual is unique whether they are male female uh, children 
right? Um, uh, something very interesting that I got to know yesterday was, um, you know, my my son is you know, he's in the upper KG. He's only six years old. Apparently, you know, I was talking to the principal of the school, and apparently, it's become a, a compulsion that even the the children, the the toddlers, must have counselors now. I thought to myself, how are we going to counsel five, six-year-olds? But they are apparently doing it. They they should sit for a counseling session. Uh, things are changing. Everything you know, things around us are changing. So uh, we must understand uh, people are unique. But one thing never changes. God is our Father, and He will be our, always our Father, and we will always be His sons and daughters. Right, and finally, we cannot love only on the group scale. So, for example, you have a group of about five, six people. Uh, it's not like we love all, you know, only when all five of them are together, you know, we overflow with love or we overflow with compassion. We're very kind, you know. And, uh, even if it's two or three people in the group uh, and, and some are missing, it should be the same kind of love, right? So, uh, it's not that only if there's a group, I will love them all. And again, every individual is unique. Whatever you do, you need a blueprint. Whatever you do, you need a blueprint. You need to see the end picture before you are ready to begin. Right? Uh, whatever you do, you need a blueprint. And this is so important, right? Uh, and we talked about, I think it was uh, last semester, so we talked about. Uh, principles in, in the ministry, principles in the workplace, uh, always have a vision, always have a blueprint of what you want to do. Uh, see the end picture even before you're ready to begin. So when you look at people, right? for example, you look at a person, you say, okay, uh, this person is really passionate about God's word. You can see the anointing of God. Uh, you can see that you know God can really use him and uh, you know, there's this gift of the prophetic inside him. Uh, all he needs to do is to develop in this prophetic. Uh, so let's, you know, let's just call him. Let's give him opportunities, small opportunities. But the end picture is, hey, one day I want to see this person preaching and teaching the word of God, being a blessing to the body of Christ, being a blessing to the people who's, who, you know, who's around him. And, uh, and so that's the blueprint. But even as you see the end picture, uh, work with them over stages right uh, uh, and we also talked about leadership how we are to you know when we offer leadership it should should it shouldn't be given all of a sudden right let people go through stages let people go through the smaller seasons just being faithful in the small and eventually give them uh, the bigger opportunities uh, the first thing you need in developing a person is to have a blueprint right uh, let's look at the next point spiritual fathering right we use the term fathering uh, in a gender independent way so it includes even mothering first john 2 12 and 13 uh, the goal in our christian growth is to go from being little children to becoming fathers and mothers and now uh, if we look at our own lives each one of us right there was a time we were little children we were just born in Christ. We had, we just knew a little bit of the word, knew a little bit about prayer, and over time, we learn. Over time, we grow. Right? I'm sure you know. Once we become a believer, we may not, you know, this happened to me personally. Right? Became a believer. I wanted to pray. I liked to pray, but I didn't know what to pray. I didn't know how to pray. Right? So it was, I think, for. Many, many months, uh, you know, I would just open my eyes, walk around. Uh, you know, there were times I would get distracted, and it was really hard. Right? But over time, I, uh, after reading the word, after hearing from leaders, talking to leaders, uh, getting instructions, uh, it, it helped me to grow in my spiritual walk. Right now, just because we are praying more in the prophetic or in the flowing the gifts of the spirit that does not mean we are uh, mature right? remember what paul writes to the corinthians 
he says hey we are we are babies in christ wait a minute paul uh, we are already flowing the gifts of the spirit we are uh, we have all the, uh, the prophetic we have the uh, speaking in tongues all of this is there we are already you know we are not babies in christ we are grown up paul is saying hey you are still babies because there is division there is strife there is hatred there is uh, uh, immaturity among you uh, and so paul is making them understand that uh, uh, spiritual growth is not only about uh, you, know, you know the yes it is focused is on the word but there are also other things that are involved in spiritual growth right first corinthians 4 14 and 15 maybe one of us can please read this uh, first corinthians chapter 4 was 14 and 15 any one of us can just open to the scripture please we read it first corinthians 4 Verses fourteen and fifteen. The difference between spiritual teachers and spiritual father. Yes. Can anyone please read that? I did not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn, I warn you. For though you might have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Yeah, thank you. So we see here, Paul is writing again to the Corinthians. He's saying, "I'm telling you all this not to shame you, but I'm telling you this because you may have a hundred of teachers, but I have begotten you, meaning I am your, I have given birth to you in the Lord. Meaning, it is through my ministry that you have come into the, you know, into Christ." you have become a believer so i as a spiritual father i am uh, i i have the responsibility uh, to 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 speak into your lives to correct you like you may have a lot of teachers now remember that paul was itinerant right so he went about many places so he planted the church he went around right so he was not there every day but there were other leaders other teachers instructors within the church Now Paul is writing to the Corinthians. He's reminding them, see, I'm not writing to you all of this because if we read uh, last semester, we did uh, Corinthians, right? We looked at how he was so upset in the in the first letter to the Corinthians, and he was only, uh, you know, bringing correction to them. So he's saying here in chapter four, he's saying, "I'm not writing this to bring shame on you, but as a spiritual father, I'm writing so that you change your ways, and it's my responsibility." i must correct you i must correct what you are doing in the church and so we see there's a difference between spiritual teacher or an instructor and a spiritual father look at that differences here we have it here a spiritual teacher teaches truths now whether you uh, listen to it whether you agree to it whether you don't agree to it it's up to you i'm going to teach Not teach God's truth, but a spiritual father will care for and help the individual to understand truths of God's word. Now it's not like the teacher won't, but his focus is I'm going to teach. I'm going to teach, instruct. A father will go the extra mile for caring and helping the individual. Right, uh, and 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 we can definitely. know the difference between them right uh, a spiritual teacher imagine asking a question to uh, to a teacher and you ask the same question again and again and again they, you know they may say hey come on i've already explained it but a spiritual father will answer that same question again and again and again with that same kind of love and care a spiritual teacher is usually formal interaction a spiritual father is an informal interaction oh yes i think somebody has raised their hand yes shri kumar you've raised your hand yeah thank you pastor yes go ahead yes. pastor i want to know that uh, how you select your spiritual father 
and uh, how you know that like uh, the difference between that uh, uh, if i want to accept somebody as a spiritual father so how you gauge or you know, what is the criteria yeah. behind it like you know you cannot be a spiritual uh, you if somebody has given you baptism yeah. and uh, now whether i have to make him as my spiritual father or uh, the church where i am going that pastor i have to make the spiritual father or somebody else i have to how can we come to that conclusion that um, you know the, he is my spiritual father yeah. and second thing uh, can a person can have more than one spiritual father or uh, you know and that is also my question because naturally there is only one father but yeah. can in the realm of the spirit can we have two three fathers so how we can able to come to that how we can differentiate this is my teacher and this is my spiritual yeah. father thank you pastor thanks yeah so that's 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 a wonderful question so shri kumar i want to start off by saying at apc but uh, other ministries may have it but here at apc we don't we don't say hey he is my spiritual father he is my spirit she is my spiritual mother we don't use that term much now there's a reason right so if we look down even in the notes we see that uh, it's not necessary so for example i'm an unbeliever right somebody comes and shares the gospel with me i become a believer it's not necessary that person only should be my will be my spiritual father now he may share the gospel with me i become a believer and after 6 months he's gone but right? he's gone to another state or he's gone to another country and i'm hardly in touch with him right but i'm going to a church here for example right there's this church i'm going to and the pastors are there the leaders are there they are investing in my life saying hey paul you can do it you you know you read this you, know, you read this portion uh, you join a life group you Uh, and I'll, I'll, I, you know, you can. I'll sit with you. You have any questions? You write them down. I, I will sit with you. I'll help you understand. And then, if I have any question, I can go to them and say, oh, you know, the Book of Revelations. There's so much I don't understand anything. Can you please tell me what it means? Or uh, why, why is Jesus talking to this? So there's a there's a person, uh, maybe one or two people also, uh, who are who is really helping me. Now, what's happening? this person brought this pastor brought me into the lord that's good right? uh, he brought me into the lord but as a as a child as a baby in christ it is these people who are equipping me right so to answer your question trikma firstly it's not that the person who gave you water baptism or the person who brought you into christ only they can be your spiritual father and mother right it is basically somebody who is equipping you to grow from being you know a, a a child in christ a baby in christ to attaining that spiritual maturity now if you look at each one of us we are all grown in the lord right we are all matured in christ right now it's not necessary that we must have a spiritual father and mother so now we, it's not like we have to go and search for a spiritual who's my spiritual father who's my spiritual mother we don't uh, we don't have to do that right we don't have to go searching for uh, it's not like without a spiritual father and mother we cannot grow in the lord no what we're trying to say is uh, it's good to have people who can speak into your lives it is good to have you know men and women of god who are Now, so for example, we are ten years in the Lord. We have, we've become matured, but there are people who are thirty years in the Lord, and they've gone through ministry. They've seen everything, so we can always receive from them, right? Uh, maybe ask questions, learn from them. Now, the criteria that you were talking about. Now, if you look at uh, what Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, right? He chose. Timothy, he chose his leaders very young, and he let them. You know, he took them along, took them, showed them the ministry. Now, even if you look at Luke, right? imagine a doctor; he's a physician, but Paul took him, right? And Luke may be wondering, oh, hey, uh, being a doctor, why should I be moving about and? Was struggling with all this persecution in church, but Paul just taught him. I don't see in the uh, last letter Timothy, Luke is there, right? The last epistle as he's writing. So uh, this, 
I wouldn't say there's a criteria as such. Uh, it could also be somebody your own age. Right? So for example, I'm 35. I can have somebody who's you know, 35, a friend in Christ, who's speaking into my life so every day, you know, just helping me. Hey, were you able to pray? Were you able to read your word? Uh, what did God speak to you today? What do you think about this? You know, uh, now in the spiritual realm, there's no age, right? There's no age. Uh, it's all about maturity. So, I would say that we don't have to go. So, another thing that we do is we don't have to go to somebody and say, "Hey, you, know, you be my spiritual father and mother." Especially in our nation, and I don't know, I'm not sure about Africa and other countries, but in our nation, this whole aspect of spiritual father, spiritual mother has gone, it's good, but it's gone to another level where you know, people are controlling. Hey, I brought you to Christ. I'm the one who taught you, so you have to be under me. What happens? It's, it's controlling. Uh, and that's not what God wants, right? The point of being a spiritual father, a spiritual mother, is to build a person to maturity, to Christ-likeness. And if God is calling them to something else, they can always move on. Right? Uh, so that's what I would leave it with, Sri Kumar. So you be, be, if there are people in your life, you, you have two or three pastors or two or three ministers, I would say the best thing to do is you, you be uh, faithful to your local church and see if your pastor, your main pastor, associate pastor, if they are speaking into your lives and you're getting equipped, you're getting nourished, you're growing, um, let's go with that. You don't have to say, okay, he's my spiritual father, he's my spiritual mother. Uh, you don't have to really say it. Uh, but you know, uh, it, it's something that uh, uh, you may have even two or three people speaking into your life. So I would say that is the criteria. Thank you, thank you, yeah. sir. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. See, uh, you had raised your hand. Was that say? I'm not sure. If it's... No, you, you already answered it. I was just going to ask if we actually find the spiritual fathers or God actually directs them to us. So I, I think you've already answered that. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. So it is sometimes, it is God, just God will direct them. God will just bring them to us. And, uh, you know, the reason, see, when Paul is writing, saying, I, I'm your spiritual father and I'm able to speak into your life. Now, at that time, he knew what he was speaking about. He was talking about uh, the responsibility of a father correcting the son and daughter. But nowadays, you know, this whole, uh, it's, it's sad, especially uh, in ministry, when we look at it, this whole thing of, you know, uh, father, mother, uh, hey, he's my spiritual father. My spiritual father told me to, you know, to sell my house, so I sold my house. I, my spiritual father told me, you know, uh, go to this other country and uh, do your studies, so I did it. My spiritual father told me take a loan, so I took a loan. My spiritual father told me, you know, uh, sell all your gold, don't wear jewelry, so I've done that. That is what has happened. That's why we must be very careful. Right? Spiritual father and mother is for the spiritual things and not for the things of the natural. Right? It is to grow and mature us in Christ's likeness right? and not to take advantage of people. So that we must be very careful about. Right? Uh, be wise. Right? Right, uh, let me just check the notes. Right. Uh, spiritual father teacher learn from his teaching. Spiritual father, you learn from his life example, life to life, spirit to spirit. Now, was the apostle Paul a spiritual teacher or a spiritual father? I would say he was both. Right. He taught. He taught them. The reason was because they were all Gentiles, right? They didn't know anything about the gospel, and the gospel was still getting out. So, yes, they learned from his teaching, but they also learned from his life example. Right? There was a huge group of people that learned from his teaching, but people like Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Luke, Lydia, 
Phoebe, all of these, uh, Aquila, Priscilla, all these. Excuse wonderful. me, Pastor. Uh, Pastor, yes. is, it, is it recording? Is it uh, recording is happening? Just want to know. Uh, it is. Yes, it's yes, it is recording. Yes. Yes, it's recording. Okay. Okay, Here it's not displaying this. <laughs> okay, no problem. All right. So, um, yeah. So as I was saying, uh -huh. the Apostle Paul was did a lot of teaching, a lot of instructing, but he also showed his, uh, you know, his fatherhood side by being a life example, life to life, spirit to spirit, and he says to. In his letters, he says, oh, Timothy, he has been with me. He has the same spirit that I have. He has seen my life. Right? So uh, he had a mixture of both. And also, uh, even now, we may have people who are teachers, spiritual teachers who teach and speak into our lives, and who will also be a spiritual father to us, right? where they uh, allow us to uh, see their life, work with them, and learn from their life. Right? Uh, in life, more things are caught than taught, and that's so true, right? It is so true. In life, many things are are by what we see, we learn, right? And I remember this. I'll give this example. Uh, I, I think I've used this example, but I never forget this. I never forget this. This is early. Uh, I think it was 2010. Uh, we went for this conference, right? Uh, as a whole team. Uh, and uh, the conference was for about, I think it was about 200 pastors. It was in the north of India. And it was for about 200 odd pastors. But what happened in that conference was uh, there was a higher number. So there were about 350 odd people who turned up for that conference. Right now, what happened was uh, the lunch break came in and uh, the food was there, but there were few, very less plates. Right? So uh, very clearly remember that. And these are the early days when I just became a believer, just trying to understand about church, about ministry, and all of these things. Right? Uh, we went and uh, lunchtime. There are about three hundred fifty of them, but there were only two hundred plates. Lucky, uh, you know. Praise God that food was there. The plates was less, so uh, we allowed everyone to eat, and then. After a while, I saw our entire pastoral team carrying those plates and going to the sink. And there were these, you know, the the leftovers of what was eaten by others. They would take them with a hand and put them in dustbins. And our pastoral team was washing all the plates. Right? Uh, and I looked at that and I was like, wow. Uh, you know, this, this is a pastoral team. And this is, they don't have to do this, but they're doing it. I will never forget this because it is, nobody taught us, you know, you as a leader should wash your plate. Jesus washed others' feet, so you wash your plate. Nobody told me this. But, but what I saw stuck on, right? Uh, and, and, and this is just a small example, but there are things that I have learned in ministry more than preaching was caught by just watching wonderful men and women of God all across our nation. Um, when I go to North India, I see the, the zeal and the passion of these pastors. Some of them are totally unafraid of persecution. They're unafraid. They, it, they say, uh, you go tell whoever you want. If I have to go to jail, I will go to jail. I will never deny the name of Jesus. I will never deny the name of Jesus. Whatever you have to do, you do. Right? They are so strong in the faith. And, and these are highly persecuted areas. And you look at that faith, and you just in awe. You know, we can teach a lot about faith and about the power of God. But when you see it real in people's life, it is, it is so real. It is so real. Right? So remember that many things are caught, than taught. Right? Uh, let's go to the next one here. All fatherhood flows from God. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father, for Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth 
is named. Sri Kumar, this answers your question. God is the ultimate father. All fatherhood flows from him. As children, we flow in that same nature that moves us to be father and mother to others. Right? So even as we you know come under the leadership of people, right? Remember that all fatherhood flows from God. Now the apostle Paul was in a place of leadership, a pioneer in the ministry, right? He did wonderful works. But what does he say? He's telling the church in Ephesus, hey, I bow my knee to the Father. It is from him everything that I that I'm doing, everything that I have is from the Father. Everything flows from him. Paul, from where did you get this great wisdom from the Father? Paul, from where did you get this great understanding of the gospel of, of this scriptures from the Father? Paul, how did you get the boldness to travel to start these churches in these persecuted areas from the Father? Paul, how did you uh, survive all the shipwreck and the persecution? And all all the challenges from able to uh, just know what God is doing and how you able to put this kind of anointing from Father. So Paul is emphasizing that. Uh, he's saying everything that I have, everything that I am, everything that I do is from the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This should be uh, our, you know, our, our, our identity. This should be from where everything flows. And of course, God will bring people to our lives. So spiritual fathering is an extension of the fatherhood of God. So there, if, if there are spiritual fathers or mothers who are telling us things that we must do that are not in line with the word of God, what must we do? We can't say, hey, it's my spiritual father and mother, so I have to do that. Why don't you just tell them that, you know, imagine a spiritual father and mother saying, uh, just tell them a lie. It's okay. Just tell them this one lie. It's okay. You tell them, no, I, I, I will not come because of this. Now, you and I must use this term. It may be your spiritual father or mother or leaders, but all, everything flows, fatherhood flows from God. Is it in line with God's word? Right? It is interesting to note that when the heart of the fathers is not towards the children, and when the heart of the children is not towards their fathers, it opens the door to a curse. Right? So our heart must be connected to the father. Father's heart is connected to us. And God brings people in between as spiritual fathers and mothers. It's an extension of what God is doing. To build his people right paul had spiritual sons and daughters uh here second timothy one and two he says to timothy my dearly beloved son to titus to mine own son again after the common faith to corinthians uh first corinthians 4 14 through 16 again we read this i write not these things to shame you but as beloved son I warn you, right? Because I have begotten you through the gospel. Like Galatians, my little children, 419, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. So you see that, right? Why are the spiritual fathers and mothers there? So that Paul is giving the answer here. I travail in birth until Christ be formed in you. That is the goal. A spiritual father and mother is is not it's not that a, a spiritual father and mother is there so they can just speak and just uh, you know uh, use them use their uh, uh, so-called spiritual children as slaves make them do the work make them go pick up their children from school go uh, clean the church uh, you know go bring your vegetables from the market uh, cook food when nobody is there that's not what uh, you know, uh, God is talking about here. Paul is saying, travel in birth until Christ be formed in you. That is the main point. First Thessalonians 2.11, As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, how as a father doth 
his children. Again, here the church was going through a tough time. Saying, hey, the rapture's already happened. They're saying Jesus is not going to come back. What do we do, Paul? Paul is saying, I, 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 he, and later on he exhorts the church, he comforts them, he charged everyone. How? Just like a father does to his children. Right? Now in First Peter 5:13, Peter considered John Mark to be his spiritual son. So there is uh, there's nothing wrong about it. But always understand why. What why does, there is a spiritual father and a mother, right? So that we Christ be formed in us. That's the main intention. Uh, it's not to you know have spiritual fathers and mothers so that we become famous or so that we say hey because of me he did this or because of me there this person is in ministry. No, right? Uh, so who is the spiritual father and mother? Sometimes we mistakenly think that the one who led us to faith in Christ is the one who is the spiritual father and mother, like how uh, Sri Guma was saying, or the one who has given me baptism, or the one who has you know prayed for me and I the gifts of the Holy Spirit came upon me. Only they can be my spiritual father and mother. But this is not always true, because anyone can procreate, but not everyone are parents. Uh, there's a saying, uh, uh, anyone can, uh, 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 yeah, I forget that saying, you know, uh, just the context. Anyone can be a father, but not everyone can be a dad. Right? So there's that relationship. Right? So anyone can procreate, but not everyone can be parents. The one who parents are the one who nurtures, brings up the children into maturity. They are the real father and mother. Right, uh, a person whose teachings have who you have imbibed through books, tapes may not necessarily be your spiritual father and mother. Now, for example, you know, now with the world coming, everything is coming, everything is close by because of internet, right? You can talk to people in different countries. Let's say, okay, this person is my spiritual father because past 10 years I'm listening to his sermons. We can listen to the next 10 another 10 years but there should a spiritual father and mother should be there to minister to you right just because i'm listening to their sermons or reading their books uh, doesn't mean they can automatically become a spiritual father and mother right? because there needs to be a two way communication imagine I, I keep saying hey this person is my dad he's my father and my father is not talking to me it doesn't make sense right so uh, a person who's in uh, a, a true spiritual father or mother is one who raises up another person from immaturity to maturity. Right now, again, uh, we want to be careful because the spiritual father and mother can only speak into their lives. After that, it's the responsibility of the child to say, "Okay, I want to grow in the Lord." Right? I remember many, many prophecies made on me. Right. They said, oh, Paul, you're going to be a worship leader and you're going to be a teacher. You're going to you know, uh, uh, preach the gospel in many places. God is going to use you and all of these things. And those days I didn't really bother. I said, okay, whatever. Okay, thank you, Lord. I would write them down, say, God. But I realized that all those prophecies are there. But if I am not reading the word, if I am not praying, if I am not spending time in God's presence, if I am not changing my life, if I am not putting away the things of the flesh, if I am not fighting against the enemy, and I am living in a sinful life, those prophecies will be there. And it will not go away, it will be there. But I can't say, oh God, this is what you prophesied, nothing happened. No. Right? There, there must be something that we must do. The spiritual father and mother can tell us, go back, read Romans chapter 1 and 2 and come back and tell me what it means. What if I don't read it? Uh, it's not like he's my spiritual father or mother. He's doing his best, he or she. Uh, but I'm not looking at becoming uh, the person from immaturity to maturity. So there's a responsibility that you and I have. I look at Timothy. Right? 
17 years old, probably around 17 years old, young boy. Maybe he had, you know, as a youth, he may have had many, as a teen, he may have had many things in his mind. He may have thought, hey, why should I come with this guy? You know, wherever he goes, people are, you know, miracles are nice to watch. Wherever he goes, there's problems. Uh, so, but then we see that he grew, right? Grew to a place that he went on to become the leader in the church in Ephesus. So Paul recognized that, right? So there was a part that we have to do. All right, let's take a break. We'll come back in 10 minutes and we'll continue from here.